My name is Kathleen Staten, and I'm the manager of Music Constructed, this dynamic platform that's here to serve you, the music educator, um, with professional development like this that's timely and relevant. Um, we're so excited to have back Lauren Belago and Maria DeValle, who uh, presented for us yesterday an introduction to this. And uh, today, really, this is all about you joining in. They'll let you know uh, how we're going to structure this session, um, but this is this is for you to get the most out of this topic. So uh, feel free to put yourself uh, your camera on and um, and take yourself off of mute and join in this conversation today. So Maria and Lauren, take it away. Thank you. Welcome everyone. We're so excited to be presenting for you today. Um, for those of you who were here yesterday, so good to see you. Um, so today's going to look a little bit different from yesterday. Today will be a conversation and it'll be a conversation on the differences between multicultural and culturally responsive teaching. My name is Lauren Delago. And I'm Maria Del Valle. A little bit about me before we get started. I'm from New Jersey. I've been um, teaching in Jersey and New York City for the past 12 years. I attended Mason Gross at Rutgers University for uh, my undergrad in music ed, and I also studied French horn performance. I'm currently a student at the Longy School of Music, um, receiving my master's in music ed on their online program highly recommend. Um, I'm currently the second grade general music teacher at the Equity Project Charter School in Washington Heights in Manhattan. So I'm Maria. I was born in Puerto Rico. That's where I'm currently tuning in from right now. I live in New York City now, but I grew up in Ohio, then Florida. I attended the University of Florida, where I studied flute performance and music education. I'm currently attending the Longy School of Music for my master's in music ed. And I have taught in schools throughout East Africa and New York City for the last 12 years. And this school year, I'll be stepping in um, of the role of director of music at Wynn Music Charter School in Washington Heights. And so here is our why for the work that Lauren and I do. We did not feel affirmed and represented in our music education experiences starting from elementary school through college. We noticed that undergraduate and graduate music education programs and the profession of music education is lacking in diversity. We want to shift the perspective of what it means to be an educator in an urban setting. And we wanna share what is working in our classrooms. So here's a little bit about the neighborhood in which um, both Maria and I teach in. We teach in Washington Heights in Manhattan. If you're not familiar, it's the uppermost part of Manhattan. Um, it's a neighborhood made up of um, different Latin American communities. Um, it's made up, a lot of our students are Dominican, Puerto Rican, Cuban, and Mexican. It's known as the Little Dominican Republic. It was an inspiration for the musical and the heights, and it is home currently to Lin-Manuel Miranda. I ran into him outside of Starbucks a few weeks ago. It was amazing. Um, it was a strategic point in the Revolutionary War, home to Hamilton and Burr, and home to Duke Ellington. Washington Heights, Take the A-Train um, is the reason behind the song, Take the A-Train, to get to Duke Ellington's house on West 157. And so for our conversation today, we wanna to be sure that we are creating a brave and a safe space. So this is also a practice that you're ho we're hoping that you can take into your classrooms. And so we want to be sure that we're speaking from a place of love and respect. We're all being vulnerable. We're showing grace for this process as we start to shift our perspectives. We're being kind and candid. We're gonna use I statements. We're going to speak to the topic at hand and we're gonna let hope be the overarching stance today. And so let's get started with a review from yesterday. What is multicultural education? Multicultural education values different students' cultures and prepares students to thrive in a diverse world. Through multicultural education, students develop positive perspectives of their own cultures, as well as the cultures of others. 
And then let's review what it means to be culturally responsive. Culturally responsive teaching is a student-centered approach that bridges student cultures and life experiences to new knowledge acquired in the classroom. So a few key takeaways on the two. Multicultural education speaks to the content, the curriculum, the repertoire, which we are bringing to students. Culturally responsive teaching is bridging and leveraging that content to student experiences, student background, and student knowledge that results in building students' cognitive capacity. So I just want to give a little bit of context on um, where multicultural education comes from, just because I think it's very important in this discussion. Um, multi, the multicultural education movement stemmed from the civil rights movement of the 60s and 70s. Multicultural education was designed to increase educational equity by incorporating ethnic and women studies, right? So that was the original idea behind multicultural um, education. There was a call during this um, time to re-examine what was being taught in the music classroom and schools were called upon to reflect the racial diversity of the country to ensure that students of color um, were being seen and reflected and what was being shown in the classroom. It was perceived as a way to bridge the gap between the white majority and the historically marginalized, right? So the ultimate goal of multicultural education was the social harmony, right? The idea that if um, privileged students of the majority culture are receiving perspective of um, students and people who are historically marginalized and then those who are historically marginalized are seeing themselves in the classrooms that it would create um, kind of a kumbaya um, social harmony situation. But in the 90s, um, negative aspects of multicultural education um, were exposed. Um, and some of those negative aspects which were being um, talked about was the idea of teachers um, kind of being seen as the gatekeepers of knowledge, right? Also known as the banking method. Um, an authentic repertoire, right? Students are being shown music of different cultures, but they're not authentic um, recordings or music um, that's being written or arranged by um, people not from the culture, people who don't have an understanding of the culture. Um, Eurocentric classroom decor, not honoring learning styles of the multicultural music that was being taught in the classroom. And so the birth of culture responsive teaching began to change urban education. Teachers began to associate culture with more than just race and ethnicity. So we're talking about the invisible culture, people's values, beliefs, et cetera. Culturally responsive teaching is beyond diverse repertoire and content. It's a comprehensive approach to demonstrate who the students are, how they perceive the world and how they operate. And so examples of this in the classroom looks like individualism versus collectivism. Do your students come from a country that values individualism like the UK or the United States? Or are they coming from a country that values collectivism like Mexico or the Dominican Republic? This will make a, a difference in your classroom should you approach individual work or group work with your students, thinking about how they're gonna learn best. Um, how are we, how are we facilitating learning experiences? Are the students learning content through reading an article or through class discussions? In which way would they learn best? Are we using only formal discussions or informal discussions? Giving an opportunity for students to simply turn and talk to one person versus talking alone in front of the entire group. And in music specifically, we can think about, are we allowing our students to learn a song by rote? Or are we only giving them experiences where they're learning from standard notation? What are our beliefs or, or um, around iconic notation or lyric sheets, right? These are topics that are up for debate. Thinking about how do our students learn best, right? Are we offering, facilitating these different types of experiences?
So to begin our, um, before we begin our group conversation, um, we're going to read a short excerpt from an article um, from the Journal of General Music Education. The title of this article is Towards a More Culturally Responsive General Music Classroom by Carlos Abril. Um, you can read along as I read it out loud. On a visit to a general music classroom, I was intrigued but not necessarily surprised by a bulletin board titled Music of Peru, which included a map of South America, images of the Andes and folk and popular instruments of the region, names of songs and pictures of Peruvian musicians and folklorists. The music teacher explained to me that her fifth grade students were in the middle of a unit on music of Peru. Students were learning to sing El Umoqueño listening to Susana Baca and Peru Negro perform, building Siku style pan pipes, performing orphan arrangements of Mi Palomita using pan pipes and assorted percussion instruments and contextualizing the music culturally and historically. The components of this thoughtfully planned unit seem to be informed by and a product of the multicultural music education movement. So I just wanna give everyone a minute to reflect. In your view, what role should the cultural background of your students play in the classroom? And how should educators seek to connect with and activate students' home cultures in the classroom? Like I said, we'll take a minute to just reflect on these two questions, and then you can unmute and popcorn out, or you can um, put your thoughts and responses in the chat. Okay, so as I said, feel free to unmute and um, share out any thoughts um, that you may have to um, these um, discussion points. And definitely make sure you have your chat window open so you can see Kathy's contributed there. Okay, so I'll read from the chat. It says, I think we should start with the home cultures from our classroom. Students should learn music from their own cultures and expand from there to other cultures. We have, I think the core and base should be the students. Any other thoughts? Students should play a role from their home cultures, can definitely inform and guide the focus of the lessons. I need to work towards doing this, but I need to find ways to make students feel more comfortable in sharing this. And we have some ideas that we can share with you today. We'll take about 10 more seconds to share any more thoughts. I struggle with including music from the non-dominant culture without making the students feel signal out. Yeah, that's important. And we'll um, talk about some ideas on how to start the conversation with students.
All right, we can go to the next slide. So we just wanna revisit again, um, a brief um, definition of what culturally responsive teaching is. It is a student-based framework that validates and affirms students' cultural backgrounds while teaching to um, and through their diverse strengths and lived experiences. So definitely that's um, right what was shared in the chat starting with the students, starting with their home cultures, and then thinking through how can that be leveraged to um, connect to new learning, to new cultural knowledge. Um, when I read that beginning of the article about the music of Peru, um, my thoughts were, um, how would students make sense of that particular music experience? And how would that experience connect with their lives? Um, was the teacher, right, it's hard to say, right, just from that small paragraph, but was the teacher already acting in a culturally responsive way because she designed an interesting unit around music of Peruvian origins, or was it because, right, maybe it was because many of her students were Spanish speakers and some were Peruvian, right? So the description of the content only holds potential for being culturally responsive. So let's think through how can we, how can we turn that music of Peru um, unit into a culturally responsive, how can we teach it through a culturally responsive framework? And I would just like to point out um, a definition um, of a term that we'll be using in this discussion, and that's null curriculum. Null curriculum deals with what students do not have the opportunity to learn, information and knowledge that are not available for student learning and are also a form of the curriculum because students are actually learning something based on what is not emphasized, covered, or taught. And so let's revisit the Music of Peru um, unit from the article. How can we teach the Music of Peru through a culturally responsive lens? So at this moment, we're gonna ask that um, everyone just popcorn out. Like, what are your thoughts on how we can approach, approach this topic? It seems to me like, if I may, um, like introducing uh, the music, the music of Peru, um, of Peru, that maybe uh, the teacher, or maybe we can, or maybe I would be able to um, include my own connections, my own cultural connections, and kind of include, create an environment in which that's a, a, a norm. You know what I mean? So that to me seems like a way to have a more culturally responsive and connection connected. Definitely. And how would you do that? Like what are the cultural connections that you would make for your students? I need to think about that a little more specifically at the moment, but I'm popcorning out that <laughs> idea first. <laughs> yes, you are on the right, right track. And it also is a way to engage students, right? Because you're sharing something about yourself with your students. Yes. Right in the chat box, it says, um, be aware of the student's culture and background knowledge. I felt like the teacher in the article was teaching in a culture responsive way. She was doing the best with what knowledge and materials she had. And so I would say it's culture responsive in the sense that it's, um, it's tapping into that null curriculum, right? Um, and reframing the curriculum and we want to think about the students, right? Like how are they best going to engage with the material? And so it becomes culture responsive when we tap into how they best learn. So are we allowing our students to do a group project because they best learn through collaboration? Are we tapping into what students already know about Peru, right? Um, or are we making connections to something that they already, something that they've seen, right? 
to be able to bridge their knowledge with this new knowledge. So without that, if it's just diverse content, then it's not culturally responsive. So here's some ideas of um, approaching this unit through a culturally responsive lens. On this side here, you see um, the characteristics of a culturally responsive teacher. So a culturally responsive teacher communicates high expectations. So how is that done? Um, something that me and Maria do is we have consistent proactive conversations um, with our students. Um, I begin my, um, every class I begin with a call and response where we discuss the expectations for today's lesson. Um, Maria has a rules chant that's a part of her routine, right? So that's always in our, um, in our classroom. Activating prior knowledge, identifying connections that can be made to previous learning. I think about um, how in the article they mention um, hand pipes. And in my classroom, we um, have a heavy focus in second grade on um, instrument families. So asking the students when they see a picture of a musician playing the pan pipes, how does it look like a sound is being made? Oh, what instrument family do we know, um, you know, uses their air? What instrument family would the pan pipes be a part of? So finding out how can you make connections to their previous learning, leveraging students' cultural capital, can you incorporate something from popular culture, right? Something that the students are already familiar with. Um, Maria mentioned, I didn't even think of this, but the emperor's new groove, right? It's something like super small, but a lot of students may be like, oh yeah, that is set in Peru. So just something of how are you hooking the content to what they know, um, through their everyday lives. Reshaping the curriculum. What null curriculum can be inserted into your lesson? What voices and perspectives are usually not shared in our music curriculum and what can be shared in this unit? Building relationships. Is there a game you can play or questions that can be asked that are related to the objective and allows you to get to know your students and allows you to build relationships with your students? And then community involvement. Are there culture bearers in your community who can be involved? another teacher, another family member. This year, um, I did a big um, unit on the music of Japan. And one of our teachers at my school um, studied Japanese um, in college and is a fluent speaker. Um, and a lot of students did not know that about this teacher. And I was able to record a video of him um, translating the song we were learning and the students loved it because he's the PE teacher and they're like what he's in our music class like this is crazy <laughs> um, is there another teacher or family member is there a local community um, resource that can be used um, we teach in New York City we always use um, Carnegie Hall resources and the New York Philharmonic so what's in your community that can be tied in then the main goal of culture responsive teaching is bridging this um, new knowledge. So what new knowledge can be bridged? We can start to think about rhythm. Lauren mentioned instrument families, right? Pan pipes or woodwinds, right? What other instruments do we know that use air? Um, genres, we can compare and contrast different genres. We can give the cultural and historical knowledge. Can we think of other ways, other musical ways that we can bridge new knowledge? Yeah, so doing a music um, from doing a unit from Colombia and um, 
teaching about Encanto, absolutely. And that is culture responsive, right? Because you are starting with the student interest. So they're already, they're hooked. They're gonna wanna know all about the music of Encanto. And discussing different foods, different traditions, celebrations. And also I wanna highlight um, values and belief systems, right? We always want to tap into the invisible culture. All right, could we go to the next slide? And so um, one way that I would approach it in the classroom is by giving a family survey. These are surveys that we give throughout the year because the answers to these questions change. And so asking what's your favorite song? What's a song that pumps you up? Um, and even like, what's your favorite show? What's your favorite TV show right now? All of these questions come into play throughout the class, throughout, um, throughout the school year. And so maybe one of my students loves a song from Peru, right? Or maybe all of them have seen the Emperor's New Groove, but because I have this information, when I start my lesson and I give my hook, I can use this information to engage my students. And then another way is to ask questions. And so you can begin with, have you ever been to Peru? Is there anyone here who's from Peru? Um, are you, have, has anyone seen the movie Emperor's New Groove? Have we live in New York City? So we constantly have conversations about different street musicians that we see. And so have you seen this group <laughs> at Times Square? And chances are in our community, the answer is yes, right? Have you ever, and then I have lots of pan pipes that I don't know how to play, <laughs> that I wish to learn to play. So I share that with my students. Like I love pan pipes, I collect them at home. I would like to get a teacher from Peru to teach me how to play. That is an int interest that I have. I tell my students, next time you see this group, ask for their number so I can connect with them. But just sharing, right? Like my own interest or connecting with the musicians we've seen on the street. And then now I have from that starting point, I can teach my students about Peru and deepen their knowledge. And then even Machu Picchu, right? Um, someone wrote something about social studies, making those connections to the units, right? That they might be learning in social studies. They may be exploring um, the greatest wonders of the world, right? So these are all different entry points, different connections that we can make to bridge this new learning. And so that is all for us today. We're gonna to continue this conversation tomorrow. Um, same time, different link. <laughs> and we are going, so please register for tomorrow. Um, tomorrow, we're gonna to continue to dive deep into what is culture responsive teaching. And you're gonna walk away with a lesson plan. And so please be sure to follow us on social media. There are questions in the chat and the chat box about um, the rules chant or other resources, go ahead and connect with us. And if you have any further questions or would like those resources, let us know. And with um, one minute left, we'd like to open it up with any questions or comments you may have. Go ahead, Tony. Thank you both so much. This has been wonderful. I just have one question. How do you um, distinguish between culturally relevant and culturally responsive pedagogy? So um, when I think about responsive, it's, I think about like how kids learn best. So I love, I just keep going back to that um, example of like, um, are they gonna learn best through group work or individually, right? Are they gonna learn best by giving a lecture or engaging in a conversation? So that falls more in the culture responsive bucket because I'm responding to my students' needs. Whereas culturally relevant or culturally sustaining pedagogy is more like um, if my students speak Spanish, how can I sustain their language? How do they get to keep their language? Or and that looks like, um, well, in my classroom, I'll give you a story. I try to do the song Dos Oruguitas from Encanto in English. And my kids were like, no, they were not having it. <laughs> <laughs> so then I tried to do it bilingual like I tried to do both no so they wanted it in Spanish and we did it in Spanish um but that me introducing it as um 
in English or bilingual is responsive, right? And then if had I introduced it just in Spanish, then I'm sustaining their culture or being relevant to their culture. Thank you, Maria, so can I ask, what, so in that example, when you introduce it in English and then your students were like, no, does that, then you're able to kind of open up the discussion to meaning and the importance of like the culture from which something comes? You know what I mean? Like, are you able to, were you able to kind of then kind of cover that so that they're yeah. able to see, because everybody comes from a culture, so we can see the importance, you know, in different ways too. Yeah, um, that's also the culture that we have, like it's their concert. So <laughs> if they okay. wanna do it in Spanish, then, you know, I'm still meeting my goal, like my, um, my objective of the day, right? Like if I want students to, to sing in their head, in their head voice yeah. or crescendo, we're gonna meet that goal no matter what language it's in, right? Um, and like, it's in, like, we, we have a lot of conversations. Like my students always speak up for the students who don't speak um, English at all. And so they're always speaking up for them. And I'm like, I know, I didn't speak English in kindergarten either. Like I understand, you know? And so we have conversations of like, okay, so let's do it in English. Like, let's practice that. Let's do it in mm -hmm. Spanish so that our audience can understand. Um, so I don't know if that answers your question, but that is how I approach these different types of conversations. It does, it seems like you, you in in order to be culturally responsive you begin to be vulnerable and very real with your students and then that allows that connection to happen and then we all get educated they see how education works exactly yeah definitely and i feel like when students like see that vulnerability um they want to open up too Maria, I was just wondering why, uh, what was driving you to want to do the song in English in the first place? Oh, because they already knew it in Spanish <laughs> really well. <laughs> so I just wanted to challenge them in a different way, which we, we did learn it in English. Um, and we just opted to perform it in Spanish. And then my goal was um, working on crescendos. And so um, that's how we were able to like um, land on that compromise. And so we're happy to stay on if anyone has um, wants to continue to chat or has any other questions. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. How do I recognize and sustain those cultures um, that are the minority in classes? Um, I think about like what concepts and skills I want to teach and then um, my repertoire is like the vehicle through which I'm teaching that right and so then that makes space for pulling repertoire from from any culture and so it is something that takes work and it have to like make sure that in our context that um, we are making sure that we're touching upon music from Mexico, music from Ecuador, um, and also popular music. Like we have to like work really hard to stay relevant. Like what songs are um, really popular on TikTok and <laughs> what's that pirate song? <laughs> what's that pirate song, Lauren, that they taught us about? It's it's a sea shanty. Yeah. Well or yeah. Oh, they got that from Roadblocks. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and so not only looking at like our students backgrounds right but what are their interests so we have to continuously learn more about our students so that we can stay relevant stay up to par into and what they're into yeah i see a comment um i'm moving to a new school this year and won't know the cultures until i get there i will hold off on concert pieces until we have these conversations thanks so much yeah and really even sometimes i i share like what my my ideas are um this is what i want to you know this is what what i want to do for the concert and this is why like this is what we're going to learn to be able to do through this piece and then um I give them room also like with one or two pieces to be able to, to give me their feedback.
says, um, how do you approach this when the majority, like more than 85% of the students are white students and a large number of your vocal families object to including music that isn't from the dominant culture? It, I think that there's many ways to approach this. I mean, history is history, right? Students are going to thrive when they have diverse perspectives. Um, and all students like have the right to learn about like the world around them. And so in order to be able to survive, right? And thrive in a diverse culture, like we need to build our cultural um, capacity. And so um, that is how I, I would approach this. But also when we're thinking about culture responsive teaching, we need to, um, again, think about like how do our, our kids learn best, right? And so it's not only about teaching music of diverse cultures, but it also is about like re-examining re um, what practices we currently have, our own pedagogy, like our own teaching tools as we're teaching new content. I also think about um, like the NAFME position statement, right? Which does state, right, that students will learn music from diverse cultures, you know? So it's literally like our curriculum, our teaching standards. And you can't get away from music from diverse places. Like the roots of, of popular music comes from black music, right? Like um, if you look at um, string instruments come from Africa. The banjo comes from banjo, Africa. Yeah. yeah, xylophones come from Africa. And so, really, like if you when you start to educate the whole community as well, like we're gonna see um, people start to open up and to really like understand the, where everything comes from. says, how do you deal with choosing songs? I know there are songs that tap into cultural appropriation. Um, Lauren, what is that organization, the World Music, World Music Institute? World Music Pedagogy. Oh, the World Music Pedagogy, yeah. Yeah, so if you go to worldmusicpedagogy.com, they have a framework on how to approach world music. And so what I'll say in short, because that's an, another presentation we can do on another day on how to dive deep into authentic music. But what I'll say is always show students an authentic recording or video of the music first. Definitely. Um, I even try to, um, I mean, I think about, um, like when teaching Native American songs, right? How we did the sacred water song and like they're supposed to learn it from an elder and how there's videos of elders teaching Native American songs on YouTube. So just trying to go to the source, finding um, pronunciation practices of songs from people who are from that culture and who speak that language. Um, yeah. A world music pedagogy is an excellent resource. You can also, to find recordings, you can go to the Library of Congress and um, highly recommend Carnegie Hall, Hall's Musical Explorers. Um, they have digital content that's free. Where they're, yeah, where they teach, they have teaching artists who are from various countries from various cultures and they themselves are teaching the students the songs and movements and instrument parts. It's a wonderful resource. And so in the chat box, I just shared Carnegie Hall's Musical Explorers and I'm also um, dropping the link to the Library of Congress. And please let us know if you want us to add on to our responses to your questions. And I think um, I see a question about using YouTube videos of music from other cultures when you do not have culture bearers in your community. Um, 
I think that's totally okay. I love using YouTube. Um, and what I love about using YouTube in the classroom um, is showing students like YouTube is more than just like looking up like Roblox videos, right? Like we can use it for, um, you know, our curiosities and music and being able to see performances and culture bearers of people from many other cultures. And my students will go home and tell me all about it the next day. Like, oh, I looked up music from Japan last night and I found these taiko drummers. And it's like, you're teaching them, you know, like <laughs> how to find authentic performances for themselves. And I, yeah, I think it's a great resource. Well, at this time, I would love to thank all of you for coming. And I especially want to thank Maria and Lauren for sharing your voices and experiences and knowledge with all of us. This has been a phenomenal dialogue and discussion. And, and just thank you to everyone who's taken the risk to be vulnerable yourselves in saying what the things are that you struggle with um, and being ready to learn. I know I'm learning so much too. We hope you'll join us tomorrow at the planning session, the application of all this knowledge. And Maria and Lauren have shared their contact information. Feel free to reach out to them directly or to us if we can be of any help with getting uh, questions answered for you uh, or support on these topics in any way. So a huge thank you and uh, we hope to see you all again tomorrow. Thank you everyone.